Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of Steelers Draft Talk. I'm your host, Steelers DB. With me is my good buddy, Nick Martin. Uh, today, we're going to be going over the linebacker class for the 2023 NFL Draft, giving you our top five, who we like, um, you know, strengths, weaknesses for these players, and uh, maybe even some guys that fell just short of our top five rankings. Just a reminder for those listening, please make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Talk. Nick, how we doing, brother? Oh, I'm doing great, man. The draft process is over for me at this point. I've got my big board out of the way. I'm just waiting for the Steelers to make those picks and hoping that they pick pick my guys because they have when they do that they they tend to, they tend to hit they tend to hit. Yeah, Alex, Alex Highsmith, Javon Hargrave, those were those are two of the best examples I can give. Yeah. Heck yeah, yeah. If you guys haven't, uh, please make sure you check out the site. Nick dropped his big board, um, very comprehensive list. There's awesome stuff in there. That's definitely uh, one of the bigger pieces that you guys need for like your draft weekend uh, in order to get that started uh, with a bang. So please make sure you check that out. That's up on the site right now. Um, without further ado, let's let's talk about this linebacker class, man. We'll get into just some general thoughts on the group overall. Um, I'll kind of get us started here. Really, this inside linebacker class to me was probably the weakest position group in the 23, 23 NFL draft. Um, it's there's a reason I think we waited until this long to kind of knock this one out as well. Um, but there are some guys in particular that I really like in terms of value and where you could potentially get them. Um, but this class really doesn't have a guy, I think, um, that's going to be that high tier Pro Bowl, all pro caliber player. Um, at the next level. Um, it honestly would kind of surprise me if we had a linebacker going the first round this year. Um, you know, a lot of these GMs are coming out saying, you know, they don't have, you know, more than 15, 16 first round grades. So it's definitely possible that one could sneak in in the second half of the first round. But I would be pretty surprised um, if that was before the last couple picks. But I'm, I'm interested to see, like, kind of what your thoughts are on the class and just, um, you know, any anything you'd like to add to that. Even in a bad linebacker class, there's always there's always a diamond among the um, among the trash, and you just have to kind of search around there. You know, like just to get started on some honorable mentions. Um, you know, I was down at the Senior Bowl, and Marte Mapu, who was originally a safety um, at Sacramento State, he had some very impressive plays on film where he could get from like far hash to like to like deep deep in his drop and make plays he also showed the ability to get downhill at the senior bowl that was the biggest thing i wanted to see from him i think he's a guy that's definitely being a little slept on in this class ivan pace was pretty unblockable half the time at the senior bowl the problem with him is he's just doesn't have much of a wingspan so he's a little bit of a liability in terms of his ability to um cover especially as a zone defender. He just doesn't have enough length to be able to contest in that regard. And Henry Toto from Alabama, he's he got better this past year. He definitely got better with his eyes in terms of reading his keys. And I thought he showed better patience. Um, overall, like the year before, he was probably an undraftable prospect in terms of just how raw he was. And I think the fact he came further this year tells me he can become a serviceable level player at the next level yeah two guys that i definitely um enjoyed watching to various degrees ivan pace has been one of my guys really dating back to um last summer um i got put on to him before he ended up trans transferring to cincinnati um this is a guy you know that was a freshman um before he transferred and he registered six sacks in a game uh, and he actually got the story uh, from him at the combine. Basically they had an edge defender go down and they had to move pace to outside linebacker and just let him rush the passer. Um, and, you know, he just came away with like six sacks. It was pretty, pretty incredible. Um, I, I believe that game was against Akron if I remember correctly, but uh, pace is an awesome player, man, like plays the game with a violent, violent demeanor, awesome pass rusher, dude. They, they just blitzed him over and over fire X blitzes up the middle. Um, he's got, he's a legitimate pass rusher. I think he would be a guy that I'd love to see in like a backs on backers drill, um, in an NFL oh, training man. camp with live pads. Cause he's, <laughs> he's going to win the, uh, the majority of those matchups. I feel like, but like you said, he just doesn't have the NFL type 
body that typically um, gets you drafted higher in in the draft. And that's unfortunate for him, but he would be a guy um, absolutely, you know, especially as we get into, you know, third, fourth, fifth round, I would, I would be banging the table for him. And because I think he's going to be a special, special teams player at the next level, just that mentality, how he plays the game. I think that's going to be an easy transition for him. And then uh, Toa Toa, I completely agree with you. I actually thought that he got better this past season. Um, I agree with you that, you know, his eyes did seem to um, improve a good amount. He was a guy that when I watched in the summer, I was like, man, I don't I don't know if I'm seeing the hype that everybody else is because he was getting mocked crazy high. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the one thing about Toa Toa that does like worry me and we'll talk about another prospect like this, but just the missed tackles. Yes. I mean they're they're just very problematic and i think for him um if i remember correctly i don't think that he's the lo- like he's not very long is he not that i remember i didn't i didn't note that his length was, okay i think was, actually i'm looking at it looks like pretty much uh it looks slightly a bit above average i don't know i guess i was thinking or just assuming that he he's was, in the 220s that's that's okay. one of the concerns it, i i yeah. know he he can get stuck to blocks a little bit and he's not necessarily like the best block deconstructor yeah. uh real quick on ivan pace the play that lives in my mind is from the senior bowl game and he's coming downhill and just knocks osiris torrance back into the running back tripping up the running back i was just like a 350 like, pound guard i'm just like that's a i'm just like that's a freaking football player man i don't care what he is that's a football player <laughs> Yeah, I have a pace. Of awesome. Awesome, dude. He's definitely like one of those guys that um, in this draft class that you're just like rooting for regardless of landing spot because he's just awesome, dude. Awesome interview. Um, high character guy. Um, definitely hope hope that he makes an impact at the next level. But um, without further ado, let's let's get into these top fives, man. Who, who's your number five inside linebacker? So this one was interesting because I got to I, I watched a lot of Pitt back in, uh, during the season and I noticed him a lot. One of my worries, um, by the way, was, is Servasia Dennis. He's my number five. Um, one of the worries I had was during Senior Bowl week, he was actually hovering below 220 pounds, which was really concerning. He got up to about 225 during the combine. Um, and during his pro day, had some very explosive jumps, just 40-inch vertical. You can see that on his film, too. Like There, there are two plays where he has leaped over the line uh, on goal line situations to stuff quarterback sneaks. And I'm just like, hey, that looked familiar <laughs> if you're a Steelers fan. <laughs> and Dennis, the thing with me, he's one of the smartest players in this class. There's a lot of good reports about him um, in terms of his cognitive ability, in terms of being able to process. And he was supposed you know, he he got accepted into Ivy League schools, but he ended up going to pit and he he a lot of people think he's one of the smartest people both on and off the off the field and you see it with his eyes he diagnoses really well he shows the ability one of the things i like he has really long arms for his size like he's like six foot two 225 but he's got like 33 inch arms which around like an 80 inch wingspan and it allows him to be able to get under or be able to deconstruct blocks a little better than guys his size you see, the worry i've always had about linebackers at 220 it's always been a hang up for me but i've seen guys recently guys like aziz al shire just be able to contribute with that type of weight and i think dennis just has too many good things going for him that i believe he can be a sir a, a solid player in, in the league i think i think sarasi dennis is a very underrated player yeah um, agree with with Dennis, man. Um, I remember a lot of talk about you know his weight kind of around the Senior Bowl time, but I thought as the week at the Senior Bowl, granted I wasn't there like you were, but I, and just in watching at home, I thought he got more comfortable, you know, as the week went on. Um, but you know, with Dennis, I think the the play recognition skills kind of stood out to me. Um, he, I don't watch Pitt religiously. I'm not a Pitt Panthers fan, but um, every time that I would tune into their games live, it seemed like he was popping on film. Uh, highly productive player um you know he's been a guy who's been a three-year starter i believe for them as well so he comes with you know a good amount of experience as well yeah. 
One of the weird things that Pitt did, though, they rotated him a lot and didn't put him in one-on-one man coverage situations as much. Mm-hmm. But whenever he had like those really like difficult coverage responsibilities, like I know to play against Louisville where he was like the deep Tampa two guy and he had a guy come up the ver- coming up vertical up the seam and he made like a fantastic play, bent the ball down, like. There's good coverage upside to him. It just seems like Pitt didn't quite trust him. I know he was kind of up and down during senior bowl week, but that's kind of hard to gauge because it's one-on-ones and it favors those pl- the offensive players way more in that regard. Yeah, definitely. Completely agree there. Um, my number five player is actually Dorian Williams from Tulane. This is a guy that you put me on um, earlier in the draft process, probably around December, January. Um, guy that I had never heard of before. You told me to check him out. Checked him out. Really liked this tape. He's actually probably, if I had to choose a my guy out of this class, it's probably Dorian Williams. Um, six foot one, two hundred twenty eight pounds, uh, near thirty four inch arms. So huge wingspan for him. Um, he's on the smaller side, but in the run game. Um, I thought he had excellent range, can go sideline to sideline with ease. Uh, his length shows up in the passing passing game where he can clog lanes and zone coverage. Um, he plays a violent style of football in between the tackles. Uh, there were several examples where I would feel like he would keep his shoulder square to the line of scrimmage and then instantly just jolt ball carriers back upon contact. Um, for a smaller linebacker, a lighter guy, um, he he doesn't give up a ton of yards after contact. I think his best attribute might be his upside in coverage. I feel like he has good feel in coverage. Um, he was one of the top graded uh, coverage linebackers last season, according to Pro Football Focus. Um, in the games that I watched, he was really sticky to backs and tight ends underneath and in the intermediate areas of the field. Playmaking chops, uh, six sacks, I think a pair of interceptions and forced fumbles last season. Um, So the production was there um, in 2022 uh, to kind of match his athletic traits. Um, Insanely fast. I mean, this dude, it was not it was not um, surprising to me, his testing numbers being what they were. Um, And just in some of the negatives or some of the things I think he has to work on when offensive linemen would uh, be on combo blocks and uh, get to the second level. They were frequently able to sustain blocks on him. In the run game, he needs to use his length a little bit better and try to get into um, in tighten inside uh, to blockers and be able to shed them out of the way. Because of that, um, you're going to have to keep him clean, especially early on while he kind of still figures out how to use his length. Um, there were times where he would be able to use like his agility to kind of slide underneath blocks. But when guys got their hands on him, the rep was pretty much over. So that makes his early down projection early on in his career a little bit murky uh, to where I'm not really sure if he's going to be, you know, I definitely don't see like year one, just plug and play starter. But I do think like you can still rotate him in, especially on passing downs. Um during his rookie season, because I think he can already do that at a high level. But um, just continuing to get better at block deconstruction um, is is at the top of his list. Um, and then I just, you know, I, like I said, I think in the rounds three or four range, which is probably where he's been mocked the most. I think that's pretty much where he is on the consensus board as well. Um, I, I would I would be willing to um, take a swing on Dorian Williams from Tulane without a doubt. From what I uh, from what I read today, uh, Jim Nagy actually believes he might go towards the top of the third round. So keep that for what it will. And that's a, that's where I have him. I, he's like my top graded third third round player. He is my number four ranked linebacker. He is one of my guys in this class. In term, it just in terms of that athleticism, you just combine it four four nine speed with one five two ten yard split. It shows up on the film. It's ridiculous just how much sideline to sideline range he has, but also just the ability to cover. Like he can get so much depth in his drop. There's so much coverage upside with him, and that's why you're really fascinated with him. But also the length and the he has really huge hands, and you, you mentioned it. He jolts guys on contact. The thing he has to do better at is when he gets one-on-one on those combo blocks like you said it when he's going laterally versus these blocks he can find ways to you know disrupt but when he's facing it one-on-one he has issues with his play strength being able to stack and you know be able to shed the the blocker a lot of times but keep him clean and i think you can get at least a salt a solid um 
role contributor in terms of, you know, mixing up what downs he plays early on while he figures things out. Like you said, I, there's just really not much I can add. You, you, you pretty much nailed it with Dorian Williams. He's, oh, your thunder a little bit, especially because that's your guy. Yeah, yeah. It's okay, man. I I put him on to you, so I I respect it that you know I allowed you to have one of my guys to be your guy so you know it's it's great and but think you know i like dorian williams a good bit too because like he has played a lot of college football and he's only 21 years old he is one of the younger players in this class and i think the fact you know he's got his degree and you know he's played so much good football like something people don't talk about he was originally a safety in high school and he played mostly as an overhang defender early on in his Tulane career similar to what Trent, Trenton Simpson does at Clemson I have some takes there I'll wait for you I'll wait for you to talk about him but um you know I think Dorian Williams is similar to him in that regard and I think he's more uh he's he's further ahead in his development than a guy like Trenton Simpson so when I see you know that that ability with Dorian Williams in terms of athletic testing, the length, everything in terms of coverage upside, there's just it's just screaming better value to me on a guy like Dorian Williams versus taking a guy like Trent Simpson high. Yep, completely agree there. Um, yeah, so my my number four guy um, is Deion Henley. Um, you know, this is a guy who's six foot, two hundred twenty five pounds, thirty three inch arms. Uh, this is a converted receiver. Um, I believe he came into college as a receiver and then transferred over to the defensive side of the ball um, at linebacker. But I think he's got awesome hit fluidity, especially for a linebacker that allows him to carry slot receivers vertically uh, with ease. And then uh, he's twitchy and explosive in space, a very technically sound tackler, uh, wraps up ball carriers on a regular basis. Only a 5.2% missed tackle rate uh, pro pro per pro football focus uh, last season, which is um, pretty outstanding, especially for a guy who likes to play downhill uh, with, I would call it borderline reckless abandon. Um, but he covers uh, ground in a flash, doesn't get completely swallowed up by bigger offensive linemen that get to the second level. Um, he will beat uh, blockers with speed and agility, um, just a very highly conditioned, um, energetic uh, guy at the second level. In terms of like the negatives for him, and things I'd like to see him uh, work on. I just think he's really wound up. And what I mean by that is like he can overrun some plays because of that. He'll run himself out of gaps or, you know, just overrun plays in the backfield where I think if he was just a little bit more patient, he would, you know, be a better position to make some uh, some more splash plays. Um, I think he's still developing a field for the position. Like I said, I think that's why, like, he's just 100 miles an hour at all times instead of just, like, reading his keys um, and just, you know, being a little bit more patient. He's also an older prospect who's going to be a 24 year old rookie. If that's something that really matters to you, um, to me, just like we've talked about with all the other position groups, I really only note that if like, if you're going to be a 20 to 21 year old rookie, that's usually a little bit of a positive in your profile. If you're going to be like a 24 or 25 year old rookie, it's a little bit more of a negative just because that oftentimes signals, you know, kind of where you are on your runway um, in terms of your development, your potential upside. But um, Henley's a really interesting player. Um, he was somebody that I got to a little bit later in the proce process, but I definitely see a, uh, a role for him, especially early on with his uh, with his athleticism, his coverage profile. Um, and, I, and I also think he's just a little bit better against the run um, just on early downs just at this point in time. Spring has sprung and our friends at Manscaped have the best tools for some spring cleaning. They've already helped you tidy up all the nooks and crannies of your body's basement. But this year, Manscaped can help you get the perfect presentation on that beautiful face with the brand new Beard Hedger Pro Kit. Make sure you look your best this spring by using our code STEALERS20 to get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. It's time to tame your mane with the Beard Hedger Pro Kit. The sun is peeking back out, which means you'll have to show off your face in the daylight once again. So, use this kit to make sure your scruff looks award-winning, whether you've got glorious beard flow or some smooth, sleek cheeks. The kit starts off with the Beard Hedger, a waterproof cordless trimmer with a rotary wheel that gives you 20 hair cutting lengths, all with one guard. So 
No more messy drawers full of add-ons. It also comes with titanium-coated T-blades that are tough on your hair but smooth on your face, leading to single-stroke efficiency that brings satisfaction one stroke at a time. The Beard Hedger is a high-tech piece of art in a travel-sized package with a long-lasting battery, universal charging, and a strong motor. Next, the kit has the liquid goods to make you feel good. Starting with the beard shampoo and conditioner, you can treat your beard like you treat your pubes. That's why the kit has a special shampoo and conditioner designed specifically to moisturize, reduce ingrown hairs, and replenish your beard's natural oils and promote beard health. The Pro Kit also has Manscaped's beard oil. The nutrient-infused oil relieves dryness both on the beard and the skin beneath while still adding a little shimmer and shine to liven up your look and cap it off with the Beard Bomb, a pomade that shapes, styles, and moisturizes, bringing the amazing scent of fresh eucalyptus, rosemary, and lavender essential oils. Not to mention the Beard Hedger Pro Kit comes with three free gifts, a beard brush, a comb, and scissors to ensure your beard is ready to impress. Save 20% off and free shipping with our code STEALERS20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with our code STEALERS20 at manscaped.com. Focus on the face and use the Beard Hedger Pro Kit for the cleanest look in the game. Fellas, have you ever wished you were a little bit taller? Maybe you matched on Tinder, but her profile says must be over six feet. Maybe your date wants to wear heels, but she can't because it will make her taller than you. Well, I got the short kings covered with today's sponsor, Kunzuri. Kunzuri makes shoes that makes you up to 2.8 inches taller without anyone knowing. Look, girls get heels, makeup, and push-up bras. Why can't men get a boost in confidence too? We're all the same height laying down anyways, if you know what I mean. For a limited time only, our listeners get an extra 15% off your order with our code ALLSTEALERS at Kunzuri.com. The site is already 30% off, and with our code, you get an extra 15%. That's 45% off your entire order. Support our show and check them out at C-O-N-Z-U-R-I.com and use our code ALLSTEALERS. Look, I'm 5'8", but I tell people I'm 5'10", and now I don't have to worry about somebody who's actually 5'10", standing next to me and calling me out. It happens all the time. Not only do Kanzuri shoes make you up to 2.8 inches taller, but they're also incredibly stylish and comfortable. These are not old man Velcro shoes. You'd get compliments on your Kanzuris even if they didn't make you taller. They have styles for every occasion too. Smart, casual, sporty, you name it. The height insoles are actually built into the shoe so no one can tell you're getting a secret height boost. The brand is also hidden on the shoes and the packaging. It's really the ultimate height hack. Life's short, but you don't have to be. It's time to level up your playing field, boys. Maybe update that pro dating profile to six feet. Kanzuri is an absolute game changer when it comes to your dating life. On top of 30% off site-wide, our listeners get an exclusive 15% off discount at Kanzuri.com with our code ALLSTEALERS. That's a total of 45% off your order. Use our code ALLSTEALERS at Kanzuri.com. Go to C-O-N-Z-U-R-I.com with our code ALLSTEALERS. When I want to get high, I put on a pair of Kanzuri's. I totally agree. Um, thing about Deion Henley for me, you mentioned the wide receiver converted background that really carries into his coverage upside in terms of his one on one ability. I really liked watching him against Utah going up against Dalton Kincaid. He had some outstanding reps in that regard. He was the best coverage linebacker down at the senior bowl. It wasn't even close. He even showed one of the things I actually really think is underappreciated about his game. He's a better pass rusher than people gave him credit for. Like he's a good blitzer being a lot of it is because of his lateral mobility and it allows him to not necessarily take on blocks, but be able to go under and over and around blocks a lot of the time because of his lateral quickness. Like he's just a very shifty guy. You, it's very hard to get hands on him. And the thing about him, I mean, think about this. Most of this linebacker class, we have a lot of undersized guys, but they're like, long, they're very long. Dan Henley is one of them. He has like mm -hmm. 33 inch arms. So he, you know, it allows him to be able to, 
you know, give him better leeway with with block, with block shedding overall. Like you said, though, he plays a little too fast, so he can he can get caught up a little bit in the blocking scheme in that regard. So he's got to improve, like improve in terms of his patience and recognition in that regard, which I think is very doable. I think it's easier to hone a guy in than to unleash the dog in them. And I think I think Henley overall, he shows good eyes for the position. I don't, there there aren't many instances where I'm like. What, what were you looking at and stuff like that. I think the only game where he really kind of sh- struggled in coverage was USC. And that's because USC scheme puts a lot of pressure on the linebackers in general, but I thought he showed, you know, good, good route recognition overall. It's just sometimes he had to make very difficult choices on who to pick up and, and what, but I like Dan Henley's game. He is he is my linebacker three in this class. I I think his coverage upside is one of the best things about him, and just the lateral mobility to be able to beat blocks. I think he's one of the safer linebackers in this class. And even though he's older, I I definitely I definitely think he's worth like somewhere in the day two range. Yeah, that's about where I ha- have him as well. Just in terms of like how I evaluate linebackers as well, like just really eyes are so important to inside linebackers like knowing what like knowing your keys like not getting fooled by you know play actions um and and things like that and i think that henley has that it's just um like you said i would rather you know have to you know reel the guy in a little bit rather than like speed him up sometimes the linebackers like they're a little bit too patient and at the next level the margins are so thin so like if you're a little bit too patient that gives that split second for that place I guard or that place I tackle to come and reach you at the second level, especially with a lot of these guys that we're talking about are playing in the high two twenties. That's problematic because, you know, you got these guards and tackles at the next level that are going to be 330 pounds. You don't yeah. want to get in those boxing matchups um, and those phone booths with those guys on a regular basis. You want to be able to, you know, scrape over top of them um, and keep yourself clean. So um, I like Kenley. He, he's, he's a nice little player. I uh, definitely think on day two, he's going to ha- hear his name called uh, my, my number three linebacker is Drew Sanders um, from Arkansas, uh, 6'4", 235 pounds, excellent size for the position, a little bit different of a physical profile than some of the guys we've talked about so far. Um, Former edge defender convert from Alabama who has some legitimate pass rushing chops, uh, whether that be off the edge or inside the box um, on blitzes. If you get this dude working downhill against running backs and pass pro, your your defense will reap the benefits. Uh, He's a rangy athlete who flows sideline to sideline well. Um, his eyes, I thought, were actually a little bit better um, than you'd expect for a guy who's only played off ball linebacker for one season. And that was really encouraging to me because of what he could potentially be in the future. Um, there are some flashes of him using his length uh, to defeat blocks uh, with, you know, good block deconstruction skills. But also he'll, you know, beat blocks to the spot with quickness as well. He is the exact type of demeanor that I personally look for in an inside linebacker. He plays physical. Um, he plays to the whistle, definitely things that I um, value at that position. Um, there are also some legitimate like pass rushing moves that you'll see him um, execute, you know, swims, rips, um, along with a little bend upon contact. Um, in terms of negatives to the position, um, he's only played inside linebacker one year. So he's still a little bit, you know, trying to figure himself out um, in that regard. He's a total projection in coverage. I mean, the things that they asked him to do in coverage were basically non-existent. If the other team was passing the ball, they were just telling him to go blitz. And to an extent, I understood it because he's such a good blitzer. But it also makes his evaluation a little bit more murky at the next level because, like, we just don't know what he could do in coverage. I mean, it's he didn't he did, hasn't dropped into coverage very much at all. Like finding reps for him are are difficult. The only one like that really stood out to me. I think he got, he got in a passing lane on an RPO uh, when he was the weak side linebacker on one play um, last season. But that was like really the only thing I could find, like just not very many reps to go off of. Um, And then just the thing with him that is maddening, which I think if it wasn't for this, he would probably be pushing for like first round consideration um, because of the, the weak class overall, but like the missed tackles are just unbelievably bad. I mean, I, I don't know that I've, I cannot recall a linebacker missing this many tackles that we were talking about as a top 50 potential player. And like, I think that Sanders can be a, um, 
can be a really productive pro, uh, but he's going to have to clean up the missed tackles or he's not going to get on the field because that is going to drive defenses crazy. I mean, I'm trying to look um, at, you know, his actual number, but it was an astounding amount. Guys, I mean, just blowing through arm tackles consistently on him. Um, so that was definitely problematic um, on his film. And it wasn't like a, a one game type of sample. This was a continual thing. Yeah. Um, looking at pro football focus, a 19.6 missed tackle rate. Um, so he's literally missing one of every five tackle attempts. I mean, it's just, it's not going to cut it at the next level. Like he's going to find himself on the bench if that, if that uh, habit, you know, kind of continues. Yeah, I the, the the hang up I had with Drew Sanders overall, he's my linebacker too, but he could have been linebacker one and arguably could have had a higher grade if his tackling was just better because you talk about it, one missed tackle for every five tackles, that is that is terrible. Absurd. That is that is absolutely terrible. Like, and in terms of functional strength, I do think there's some room for improvement there. He hasn't fully filled out his frame. Um, you talked about his block deconstruction skills. I think he shows the ability to be able to do that. I think the problem is he gets really tall on his pad level too often and he ends up getting a, and he ends up not being able to, to shed the block fully, but he shows the ability to be able to get around blocks, be able to beat him with his hands. I mean, he's, he was an edge rusher and he has legitimate blitzing skills. That's the thing I absolutely love about his game. And I, I wish I could, I wish I could put him higher because I think he has really good versatility and I while he wasn't used in coverage all that much I did find some games like against Old Miss Mississippi State where he had you know he had to make plays as as, as a coverage linebacker and he had to you know figure out what routes in terms of recognition and like you know wh which one to go go for in terms of where he was in his zone and I thought he showed you know, good ability to be able to pick up what he, sh what he was able to do there. I do think it's going to be a little bit of a learning process if you at put too much on his plate, but if you keep it pretty simple overall, like or early on, I think you can reap the benefits, especially as a blitzer. Like he, he can't be blocked by, by running backs. He gets abs. He'll just push the running back right back into the quarterback. It's insane. Some of the power he can generate, just being able to blitz from the inside and his hand usage as off the edge, it's really good for, for a guy who's playing off ball linebacker. Like there, there's definitely things to work with, with Drew Sanders, game. And I think the fact he is an ascending player in this regard, considering he hasn't played the position very long is a very encouraging thing. You just, it's just, you have to clean up the functional strength and the tackling. It's one of the, it's the main thing that has to fix with his game. But if you do, he's a very high boom bust player, in my opinion. Yeah, completely agree. I mean, like you mentioned too, like just filling out his frame, considering he is like six, four, like there, there is room to continue to put on like functional mass to his frame. And I think that's, you know, exciting. If you're looking for a guy who's got a little bit more upside, um, just in terms of, um, you know, who I have. Wait, wait, was Sanders your number two? Did I steal your thunder Drew, on that one? Drew, uh, Drew Sanders was my number two, yes. Um, okay, gotcha. And, I just wanted uh, to make sure before I, before I moved on. Guy he reminded me of actually with the line, you know, with the blitzing potential was Anthony Barr from UCLA. I remember. Okay, him that's a good in, one. Yeah, I remember him back in the day, and I think he could be used in a very similar type of role and. You know that type of player is valuable. Obviously, we're seeing it in the biggest way with Micah Parsons, who is just an unreal athlete who could pass rush, but also be able to cover as well as he does. But Drew Sanders, you know, there's more warts to his game, so you have to iron those things out. But we talk about you know linebackers being more valuable in today's game if they have that versatility, and that's why Drew Sanders might go higher in the draft than people think. Yeah, and I think with, um, you know, I've seen some, like the Michael Parsons obviously is the unrealistic top end of that comparison, but um, yeah, I could even see like a Baron Browning situation, um, a little bit, you know, yes. recent to where like some That's teams like legitimately may just value him as an edge rusher. Like he, he does have the hand usage, he has a little bit of bend, he had enough pass rushing moves to where I could, I could see that, um, 
you know, some NFL teams would prefer him, you know, just as a blitzer. And Browning, he's a guy who had played inside off ball linebacker, also played some edge. And he he did some good things for the Broncos last year when he was healthy. So uh, he's going to be an interesting player. I think fit, like you said, with that boom bust potential, I think fit and patience are going to be the two biggest things uh, really for him uh, yeah. as we head into draft weekend. I like the Baron Browning thing, by the way. That was that was a good call. Uh it was uh, it was unfortunate he got hurt this this year. He was he rolling was, a little bit. He, he, was, he was going rolling. off, man. Um <laughs> uh, my, my number two player is Clemson's Trent Simpson. So height, weight, speed, I mean prospect at the linebacker position, a rare physical build um for a linebacker. He's both fluid and explosive, positional versatility. He's played some safety, some overhang, Mike, even lined up in the slot. He's played Will can do a little bit of everything um, in that regard. He can carry receivers, tight ends up the field vertically, flips his hips with ease, excellent uh, closing speed. That was something that I noted with his profile. When he sees something in front of him and is asked to just run and chase, he he's there in the blink of an eye. Uh, well-built linebacker. He's incredibly – like, he's just jacked. That's yes. the best way that I can describe him. He looks like he was made in a lab, and I think he's actually pretty strong. Like, there are instances where I feel like he doesn't carry his weight as consistently, I guess, like in block deconstruction situations. But the, then there are flashes of, like, just really uh, impressive play strength. And I think that, you know, that, that will be something that he continues to get better at with age, but really explosive downhill and coverage. And as a blitzer, he takes on running backs uh, and pass pro with physicality. Um, just in terms of the negatives to his tape, or just the overall lack of playmaking. A lot of the tackles that I felt like he made were just further down the field where he was just kind of waiting um, and allowing guys to kind of drag him forward. Um, when, you know, he really needs to work on block deconstruction in, in general, stacking and shedding guys at the second level. Um, he was a guy that I felt like just got stuck on blocks far too often. Um, and then, you know, the last big question, and I think this is another guy who, you know, teams may value at different positions. I just don't know if he's actually an inside linebacker. Like, I think he's a good player, but I honestly thought his 2021 tape was more impressive to me than his 2022 um, because that was he was honestly one of the hardest guys that I had to grade and evaluate. And I know I'm saying that about the number two prospect on this list, which kind of tells you probably more so about how I feel about this position group in general. But I would be a fan of getting Trenton Simpson as like a weapon type, but I don't know if he's ever going to be like a true every down, like Mike linebacker. He's somebody that you absolutely have to keep clean. I like his versatility in the slot. You know, he played some, you know, safety, some slot um, in recent years. And that, that, that kind of usage may actually be better for his profile rather than, you know, trying to clean up some of uh, his issues that he has in the middle at this point in time. But He's going to be a guy that the NFL likes. Just how the NFL evaluates linebackers, that prof that the type of profile that Simpson offers, he's going to go. I still think he goes top fifty, even if his tape doesn't necessarily say that he's a top fifty player right now. I think about how high Devin White went every single day. <laughs> yep, a lot of those examples, really. I mean, like if you just look at the linebackers who have went in the first round. In like recent years, I mean, and the hit rate's not great. Like, let's let's just be very clear. You have guys that are serviceable role players, like your Patrick Queens, your Devin Whites, guys who fill roles but aren't necessarily complete players. You've got guys that it just has not panned out for, like Devin Bush, like uh, Jared J Davis, Jamin, da Jamin Davis, Jared Davis. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, there's just a bunch of guys that have went early in the draft based on this similar physical profile that haven't worked out. But Simpson's versatility, his ability and coverage, uh, especially in man coverage, I felt like was where he was really strong. Um, you know, I think that he could potentially be a guy that maybe pays off this type of investment um, in the in the later part of the second round or something like that. Part of my hangup with Trenton Simpson, uh, a lot of times uh, when he was playing uh, inside inside linebacker at the second level, and he had to make you know key key reads and all um, moving sideline to sideline, I thought his eyes got lost way too often. A lot of times, I would see him almost run into blocks 
that he where the running back wasn't even like you know trying to angle him to like cut back and he ends up just putting himself out of position and that was one of the things that was just so concerning to me as a linebacker i need guys who can you know be able to see the backfield well and that's one of the things i actually thought trenton simpson i thought his eyes actually looked a lot better from a third level perspective uh versus the second level at least inside i think you could play him a little bit more outside closer to the box or you could play him like deep third third level as like a safety i actually have him as a safety in my rankings uh because i do think he just has issues processing overall as a linebacker but you talk about the coverage upside i do think he played a little more as an overhang defender than i personally would have liked um just playing the curl <laughs> playing the curl flats is not very entertaining overall watching a watching a linebacker but when he got to cover up the seam, I was really impressed with some of the things he did. There was a really good play versus uh, Blake Whitehart of uh, Wake Forest, an underrated tight end. Ends up covering him up the seam, gets his hands up um, in the passing lanes, able to break up the pass. I thought whenever he was able to do stuff like that, I thought he he really shined in that regard. I think there's good man coverage upside. That's part of why I think he's a safety. I think he uh, could thrive more in, in the in the box, like towards the outside. And I think he can thrive more as a deep, as a deep second half, uh, say, as a deep second half safety. Maybe he has the range uh, to be single high. I don't know because like he has that one four eight, like ten yard split. split. It's unridiculously, it's ridiculously explosive. Like when you talk about the closing speed, when he closes, it's instant. Like that's the only thing in his game that reminds me of Ryan Shazier overall, which I know Steelers fans. They, they look at Trenton Simpson and some people are like, oh yeah, this guy could be Ryan Shazier. And I'm like, no, Shazier was better as a, as a like processing the run and getting downhill. I thought he was really good in that regard. It's for Shazier was just really raw in coverage overall. And that's where he had to grow his game. I think there's a big difference between those two, but I think you can figure out a role for Trenton Simpson. I just think he's a very raw player overall. You're going to have to have, have patience with him, have the right coaching staff to be able to maximize his strengths, minimize his weaknesses. He He's one of the most conflicting players in this class, and it's one of the reasons I had to put him at safety. I just I just couldn't put him at linebacker. I just think there are better linebackers than him. Yeah, completely get it. Like I said, I, I definitely think that some teams are going to value um, him as a safety or as a slot corner. I just – one thing that does worry me is like we just have not seen guys like this pan out be extremely successful at the next yeah. level recently. Like you think back to like Isaiah Simpson, doesn't really seem like the Cardinals have a good idea or a good feel on how to use him. And that's what really worries me with Simpson. It's like I, I really like the athletic profile. I just worry that like how his role and usage is going to be deployed. Yeah. Isaiah Simmons was my comp because I do think they are used very similarly. And I do think um, he like Simmons is better in like the outside safety role overall, as opposed to being inside and taking on mm-hmm. these 300, these 300 pound pounders and on combo blocks and stuff like that. And that's where I think Simpson, like he he's, he's more in that mold more than anything. And just so people know like teams have talked about Trenton Simpson playing safety. This is not something I'm, I'm talking about even, you know, I I wanted to see, but um, Devin Jackson, who I believe covers the, the Eagles on the Philly inquire, he has teams have talked to him about playing safety. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I definitely think that would be a really good fit for him as opposed to taking on these 300 pounders and having to get his eyes around the trash, but he just gets lost too often. I just can't do it. Yeah. No, completely understandable. Um, My number one inside linebacker prospect is Jack Campbell from Iowa. I was, I was very, very relieved that I, when I got to his tape, because I was looking for this, you know, top 50 certified linebacker in this class and was getting to the end of the road without finding one until I came across Campbell. So 
Uh, 6'5", 245 pounds. I mean, this is the ideal prototype Mike linebacker build uh, for the NFL level. I mean, that's it makes his projection really easy because he's got the he's got the size, he's got the athleticism. He tested a lot. I kept telling people before the combine, I was like, this dude is a good athlete. I don't know that he's this elite all-time athlete that he tested at. Let me be clear. But he was a good athlete on film. I don't know where people were saying that he wasn't a good athlete. I did not get that at all. Um, but I think the number one thing that comes to mind with Campbell's uh, profile is just how instinctive he is. Um, he's instinctive as a run defender. I think he's got really good eyes, constantly flowing to the ball, doesn't overrun plays. Um, I think that he does a good job just scraping over the top, keeping himself clean. Um, you know, I don't think that he's overly twitchy, but he takes really good angles um, to the ball. Um, in terms of in coverage, man, like this dude's underrated up until about a month ago in coverage because now I feel like people are starting to get on board. But in zone coverage, this dude has an unbelievable feel uh, for route concepts that are developing yes. behind him. That was one of my favorite parts of his film. Um, I think back to the Ohio State game against C.J. Stroud, where he pretty much reads this, you know, dagger concept coming across the field, able to get underneath it, make a highlight reel level interception. Um, so I just I, I love the coverage upside with him because I think he already has a good feel and good processing as a zone defender. Um, maybe he doesn't have, you know, the main coverage chops that you'd want to consistently handle assignments like up the seam or um, in the slot, but still offers plenty of upside in that in that department. Um, but yeah, I really just think that the ball skills, they're good enough. I think his hip fluidity is good enough, um, at the next level. This is a player that I would 100% be willing to bet on in the top 50. I think he's going to be a good player. I don't know how the NFL is going to feel about him. Um, but I, but I'm certainly on board just in terms of like the negatives. Like I said, I don't think that he's going to be this. Um, I think if you're expecting him to be this elite level athlete, that's going to be like this huge playmaker in the backfield. I don't know that that's going to um, be the case for him at the next level, just because I think he's a good, but probably not great or overly twitchy athlete. Um, I also think like be he does have the size to stand up to blocks that are getting to the second level um, and he can fill um, his gaps well but i'd like to see better hand usage um, for him just in terms of uh, to help um, just with his size and physicality um, to help him in those block shedding moments so um, campbell number one guy for me on the list uh, definitely am a big believer in his profile um, and how it's going to translate to the next level i think he's going to be a really really solid starter Campbell is the easiest projection out of the linebackers, and that's why he's a top 50 player in this class. <laughs> like the NFL with linebackers, they tend to overvalue um, like the very sexy traits, and then they end up o overlooking the big, you know, meat and potatoes, which is the eyes, the play recognition, the ability, the, the understanding of route distribution. That's, that's the thing you talked about the ability to feel routes behind him. It, and in terms of being his own his own coverage defender, he is so good in that regard. He just has great spatial feel um, knowing where he is being able to take as many concepts uh, routes away as possible. Um, like he's really good. Take, you know, he's good taking on blocks. He's functional in that regard. He's got decent sideline to sideline speed. I think, um, one of the things that was really interesting on my first watch through with Jack Campbell, I thought he was more of a Nick Kwiatkowski type of athlete in terms of being like a four, seven guy who was going to be like a very functional linebacker at the next level, but maybe better cover, maybe better coverage feel overall. I think there's a little bit more upside. I think Campbell might be more, might be closer to a Leighton Vander Esch overall, who I was a big fan of uh, like coming, that out, comp. coming out of college. Um, but the thing about Campbell, he doesn't have the neck concerns that uh, Vander Esch had. So there's a lot of good things working in that regard. Um, similar concerns, though, um, regarding like some of his um, his blitzing capabilities or maybe his one on one man coverage responsibilities. Like you might not be able to match him up consistently in those types of situations. And as a blitzer, he doesn't re like he, like you said, he's not very twitchy overall he's more smooth than he is twitchy right. in, in space so it makes it really hard for him to be able to beat guys with his hands be able to win with speed to power or just be able to like swim over them consistently he's just not much of a threat as a blitzer 
the NFL tends to be kind of weird with linebackers like this because they want a lot of that versatility in their linebackers. But Campbell's one of the safest players in this class. You can't go wrong with him. So obviously he'll find a way to tr- to drop into like the third round somehow at this point. Yeah. <laughs> but but I like Campbell's game. I think he's I think he's going to be a very solid player at the next level. Might not be the ultimate playmaker you're looking for, but you're going to have no issues with Campbell as a longtime starter on your defense. He's also he's really good at lining guys up, being able to point out plays before it happens. He's just a really smart player above above the uh above the neck. He's yep. just really good. Fully agree, man. It does seem like, you know, I, I'm I say this all the time like as a joke, but I'm not I'm really not sure the NFL knows how to evaluate linebackers. I mean, I'm not saying that we do either, um, as like draft analysts, but um it does seem like the NFL has had a horrific um hit rate on linebackers early in the draft. And I just I think in part because it touches on some of the things that you said, like teams just overly prioritizing splash plays instead of consistency on a down to down basis. And I think consistency is a good way to describe like Jack Campbell. I think you know what you're going to get. Um, I have zero, zero hesitations about him being a starting NFL linebacker. I mean, um, I'm willing to bet on that uh, projection all day. So um, definitely a, an interesting class overall. Hopefully that wasn't too negative. We tried to find the positive uh, outlook on a lot of these guys, but you know, it's just, it is what it is, man. It's one of the weaker, if not the weakest position group in the draft. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Please make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash all Steelers talk. We are winding down the draft process with uh, very few. I think we've got one or two position groups that we we might try to hit before Thursday when we kick off uh, draft weekend. But as far as Nick and I, we both appreciate your guys' support throughout the process. Uh, drop a like, drop a comment. Let us know what you think of our rankings, what you thought of the episode, um, and we will see you guys next time. Peace. Peace.